Welcome everyone to the Ten Commandments of Butterfly Gardening. My name is Tom Terrific. Most people know what a rose garden is, and they have certainly seen a vegetable garden. But what exactly is a butterfly garden? Here's a quick definition. A butterfly garden is growing the specific plants, bushes, trees, and vines, which will attract and keep butterflies in your yard. You can have a beautiful garden filled with flowers, bushes, and trees, and yet it may not attract one butterfly. Let's start with the basics, the Ten Commandments. Now, don't get paranoid that you have to follow each commandment exactly or you won't have any butterflies. The commandments are more like guidelines. The more you follow the guidelines, the more butterflies you'll have in your garden. If you're like most people, this is your typical suburban house. You got beautiful green grass and maybe a tree or two, and evergreens surround the outside of the house. Pretty, boring, and dull. Butterflies will never visit this house, so keep flying right on by and keep on going. On the other hand, if you surround your house with the right plants, butterflies will hold their annual convention right in your yard. The goal I have is to create a butterfly house like the one you see in Faust Park, St. Louis, Missouri except that we won't have any glass walls. I want to be able to walk outside and be surrounded by butterflies. Now here's the question. Why butterfly garden? Well, the easy answer is butterflies are beautiful. They're like a work of art flying through the air visiting your gardens. One of my goals in life is to surround myself with beautiful people, beautiful flowers, and beautiful butterflies. Butterfly gardening has allowed me to do all three. Why butterfly gardening? Because Emeril Lagasse is right. Emeril has a cooking show and he has two favorite phrases. One is BAM, but the other is kick it up a notch. That's what we're trying to do with butterfly gardening. You have a choice. You can have the typical dull, boring yard, or you can have the yard kicked up a notch by butterfly gardening. Another reason to have a butterfly garden is to try to compensate for all the destruction and loss of habitat that we've had in the past, present, and will have in the future. With most new construction, the common practice is to go in with a bulldozer and wipe out any vegetation they find. And in the process, they not only destroy all of the plants and trees, but they also destroy the butterfly population. It really is a shame, but that's what we call progress. And then what 99% of professional landscapers do is to cover any remaining bare earth with grass and evergreens, just like the suburban house. The butterflies don't have a chance to return or come back. The other side benefit of butterfly gardening is that you not only bring back butterflies, but you also bring back other animals. Of course, you bring back the bees and the other insects. A lot of the birds will come back. They'll not only eat the insects and seeds, but they'll use your trees and bushes to raise their young. I even have hawks visit my backyard to help keep everything in balance. You can also create your own private nature sanctuary. With some of the nature groups that I belong to, we have to travel at least 30 minutes and in some cases up to an hour and a half away from the city to visit the different parks. And with the price of gas being so high, why not save the time and energy and money and put the park in your backyard? That's what you can do with butterfly gardening. Butterfly gardening is also great because it's what I call a holistic activity. It involves everything about yourself. It encompasses both the physical, the mental, the and the artistic. Number one, it's great exercise. In fact, the U.S. government says that gardening expends more calories per hour than working out in the gym or walking. When you work in the garden, you are expending 330 calories per hour. Do the math. If you work in the garden just an hour a day, you can lose up to three pounds a month, 36 pounds a year. And you'll save that expensive gym membership. Butterfly gardening is also great mental stimulation. There are many great books on butterflies and gardenings which will keep your mind sharp. There's always something new to learn. If you go to my website, butterflygardening.org and click on the butterfly books link, it will show you some of the great books available. Butterfly gardening can also be a great way for you to express your artistic side. Many times people walking by my house will make the comment to me that, oh, 
you have such a beautiful garden. I bet it takes a lot of work. And I always have the same answer. Nope, doesn't take any work at all. But it does take a lot of love. As you plant your different flowers, it's almost like Vincent van Gogh painting on a canvas. You're creating a masterpiece, but instead of using oil paints, you're using living plants. Now when you start out, you're not quite sure how the masterpiece will turn out. But as you garden over the years, it becomes easier to visualize and see the finished product. Let's talk about some basic butterfly biology before we get into the gardening. Butterflies are insects and they have four stages of development, and the whole process is called metamorphosis. Butterflies start their life as an egg on a leaf. The eggs are usually hidden from view, but not always. In about three days, a tiny caterpillar breaks out of its shell and starts its second phase of development. Another name for the caterpillar is larva. The larva is an eating machine, and within two or three weeks, it will increase its size approximately 3,000 times. It usually sheds its skin about four times as it grows larger. When the caterpillar is finished eating, it finds a convenient plant to hang on, and then it sheds its skin for the last time and changes into a chrysalis, also called a pupa. The chrysalis stage usually lasts for about a week or two, and then the butterfly is ready to emerge and start the process over. The butterfly doesn't have a mouth, but it does have a proboscis. It's a straw-like tube which can uncurl and suck up nectar and other liquids. Now let's start with commandment number one, which is grow host plants for the caterpillars. A host plant is a particular variety of plant on which butterflies will lay their eggs. Every butterfly is very specific about which plant it will lay its eggs on. Monarch butterflies will only lay eggs on types of milkweed. Great spangled fritillaries will only lay their eggs on members of the violet family. And cabbage whites will only lay their eggs on members of the cabbage and mustard family. So this is what I call the reverse butterfly cycle. If we want butterflies in our yard, we first have to have caterpillars. If we want caterpillars in our yard, we first have to have eggs. And if we want eggs in our yard, we first have to have host plants. It all starts with host plants. If there aren't any host plants, you're not going to have butterflies. Now the question is, where do you find the host plants? Well, if you go to the local big box stores, places like Lowe's and Walmart, and even most nurseries, they will have plants like roses, petunias, and begonias, and a lot of different annuals. But unfortunately, those are not host plants for butterflies. Host plants have to be very specific. The black swallowtail is a fairly common butterfly. It uses a number of different host plants. It uses rue. Rue is a nice plant. It's got a nice flower. It's got a nice size and color. Unfortunately, it can also cause a rash with some people. So you have to be careful when planting this. Partridge pea is a nice host plant. It reseeds itself every year. It's a little bit invasive and wild, so you have to give it its own special area. But it's a host plant for cloudless sulfurs and little yellows. Spice bush is a nice host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. The caterpillar is very unusual and it hides itself by folding up the leaf. The locust is a good host plant for silver spotted skippers. I have quite a few of those in my yard. I have a complete list of host plants. Again, on my website, butterflygardening.org. Click on my garden and it will show you all of the different host plants that I grow. Many times people will ask me what caterpillar is this or that and I'll always ask well what plant is it growing on and that's a dead giveaway to what the caterpillar is because if you know the host plant then you know the caterpillar here are a few common host plants and their butterflies for cabbage white we have cabbage members of the mustard family things like broccoli cauliflower what I like in particular is kale it's a beautiful plant it's got a nice color and even has a nice yellow flower, which the butterflies can also use as a nectar plant. For the black swallowtail, you can use dill, fennel, parsley, rue, any of those are nice host plants for the black swallowtail. There are a number of different types of milkweed that will work for the monarch butterfly. In particular, I like Asclepius incarnata, which is also called swamp milkweed. Don't worry, you don't need to have a swamp. Just any ordinary garden soil will do. 
Also a Sclepius tuberosa, which is the butterfly weed, is a beautiful looking plant and is a good host plant for monarchs. Spice bush is a good plant for the spice bush swallowtail. For trees, try to plant the tulip tree, tulip poplar. It gets pretty tall but doesn't spread out too much. It's a host plant for the tiger swallowtail. Hop tree is another nice tree to put in. It's a relatively small tree and seems to do pretty well in sun or shade. It's the host plant for the giant swallowtail, which is the largest butterfly we have here in Missouri, and it is spectacular. The violets are good host plants for the great spangled fritillary and also other fritillaries. Pipe vine is also a host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail. It's a bit invasive, so give it a space where it can spread out a little bit. Skipper butterflies, small little butterflies that sort of skip around, use different types of grasses as a host plant. In particular, they seem to like my Bermuda grass. A complete list of host plants and their butterflies is on my website, again, butterflygardening.org. In closing, one of the things I've learned about host plants is that you need to experiment. Just because one book says that plant A is a good host plant doesn't necessarily make it so for your area. Different area butterflies seem to prefer different types of host plants. I'll give you a good example. Painted Lady is one of the most common butterflies. Seems to prefer to lay eggs on pearly everlasting in my yard. Another plant called Pussy Toes Antenaria is also supposed to be a good host plant for our Painted Lady, but they've never laid eggs on that particular plant. So you need to experiment and try different plants and see which plants will work in your particular area. So again, commandment number one is grow host plants for the caterpillars. Commandment number two is to grow nectar plants for the butterflies. Since butterflies can show up at about any time, I try to have something blooming during all three butterfly seasons, spring, summer, and fall. I use a general guideline of 10% flowering in the spring, 40% in the summer, and 50% in the fall. The butterfly population is lowest in the early spring. It gradually builds during the summer and then it explodes in late summer and early fall. For my location in St. Louis, late August is my best butterfly time. Some of my top nectar plants are these. In the spring, viburnum, dame's rocket, scabiosa, and golden privet. In the summer I recommend the common blazing star, Coreopsis Salvia My favorite is a variety called Lady in Red Shasta Daisy Dianthus Anise Hyssop Maltese Cross, Verbena bonariensis, Zinnias, Butterfly Bush, Butterfly Weed, Echinacea, Slender Mountain Mint, Swamp Milkweed. In the fall, I recommend Tropical Milkweed. This is an annual that you'll need to start from seed every year, but it's a favorite with the monarchs as they migrate south. 
New England Aster. Sedum. And other blazing stars like Meadow, Rough, and Eastern Blazing Star. These are all good fall nectar sources. Trying to find some of these plants is an adventure. Unfortunately, the big box stores have plenty of flowering plants, but many of them are not good nectar sources. Roses, begonias, petunias, and geraniums are beautiful, but they're not good nectar plants for butterflies. There is no one nursery which specializes in butterfly plants. You'll have to search your local nurseries, and in many cases, the internet to find a source. My website does have a good list of many national nurseries, which will aid you in your search. Just go to butterflygardening.org and look under the tips area. As your garden grows with both host and nectar plants, you will probably also want to label your plants in some ways. I found the easiest and least intrusive way is to use metal plant markers. You can find them at your local nursery or on the internet. I found through experimentation that a number two medium pencil is the best marker to use on the metal labels. So-called permanent markers are not permanent in the outdoors. So again, commandment number two is to grow nectar plants for the butterflies. Commandment number three is to grow a smorgasbord of flowers. I'm sure you know what a smorgasbord is in a restaurant. It's filled with different meats and chicken and fish, vegetables, breads, desserts. You may literally have a hundred different possibilities to choose from. Everyone can find something which they'll like. The same philosophy applies to butterfly gardening. If you fill your garden with lots of different nectar producing flowers, the odds are that the butterflies will find at least one which they will like. When my garden is in bloom, I have a smorgasbord of flowers which the butterflies can choose from. Unfortunately, many gardeners, especially professionals, plant only one variety of a flower in a garden bed. The display may look nice, but it only offers the butterflies one choice. In this particular case, the butterflies only have petunias to choose from, and petunias are not good nectar plants. Butterflies at times seem to be finicky eaters. If they're nectaring on Slender Mountain Mint, they will usually stay with that flower and not venture off onto a different plant. If you don't have the right flower, they may fly on by. This is especially nice to remember if you're taking pictures. If you scare a butterfly away, there's a good chance it will come right back to the same flower. The more choices you have for the butterflies passing by, the better are your chances that they will hang around. In some cases, you may want to group your plants to get a nicer display. I would never plant just one zinnia by itself. I usually give them one large area. This makes it a bit easier for butterflies to move from one flower to the next, and it makes it easier to watch them. Other larger flowering plants like Slender Mountain Men and Milkweed don't need to be grouped together as they produce many flowers on one plant. Commandment number three, plant a smorgasbord of flowers. Commandment number four is no pesticides. Most people want a beautiful garden, a perfect garden, and will do just about anything to get it. Their garage is filled with pesticides of all kinds, and they have a regular spraying schedule to make sure that none of their carefully tended plants get chewed up by those nasty bugs. Butterfly gardeners, on the other hand, realize that any pesticides not only kills the so-called bad bugs, but also kills butterflies in all their stages. But you may ask, what about safe pesticides? Things like dormant oil spray, BT, and insecticidal soap. Again, the answer is no, they're safe, only for humans, not the butterflies. Commandment number 4A is no predators. I'm sure you're tempted then, since you can't use pesticides, to go to your local nature center or nursery and buy some beneficial insects to keep down the bug population. Unfortunately, beneficial insects are predators, so they could just as easily feast on your eggs, larvae, and adult butterflies as they would on other insects. What about ladybugs then, to hold down the aphid population? According to Cornell University, when aphids are in short supply, ladybugs may eat butterfly eggs and larvae. Now I do control one pest, the Japanese beetle, but I use a very simple procedure. The beetle is rather large and a bit slow to move, 
I take a small amount of water to which I add a teaspoon of spreader sticker. I put the container underneath the beetle and as I touch the beetle with my finger, it falls into the water and drowns. Commandment number four, don't use pesticides. And commandment 4A, don't buy predators. Commandment number five is to find out which butterflies are in your area. Why is this important, you may ask? The answer is, otherwise you might be wasting your money. If you look at Jeffrey Glassberg's book, Butterfly Superdoculars, The East, on the cover it shows a picture of a Gulf fritillary, a beautiful butterfly. Its host plant is the passion vine, a vine which can be found in many nurseries. Logically, you might then buy the plant and wait for the butterfly to appear. Unfortunately, the butterfly's upper range is middle Missouri. If you live in Iowa, it will never show up. You've just wasted $10. On the other hand, if you'd like to attract the pearl crescent to your yard, its host is the aster, a readily available nursery plant. The Pearl Crescent's range includes Iowa, so you've just made a good investment. So the trick is to just buy host plants for butterflies, which will show up in your area. Where can you find such a list? The North American Butterfly Association has chapters in many states, which should have good local butterfly lists. Also, my website, butterflygardening.org, has a list of books which I recommend which will help you identify local butterflies. Here's some video of common butterflies. Azure, spring and summer types. Black swallowtail. And cabbage white. Common buckeye. Dusky wings, there are many different varieties. Eastern tail blue. Gray hair streak. Hackberry. Monarch. Morning Cloak, The Orange and Clouded Sulphur, Painted Lady, Pearl Crescent, Question Mark, Red Admiral, Red Spotted Purple, Skippers, there are many local varieties, in many cases they're very hard to identify. Silver Spotted Skipper, Tiger Swallowtail, Variegated Fritillary, Viceroy, again commandment number five, find out which butterflies are in your area. Commandment number six is let the sun shine. Sunshine is important to a butterfly garden for two reasons. Number one, butterflies are cold-blooded. That means they can't fly if it's too cold. They need either warm air or sunshine to heat their bodies. That's why many times you'll see a butterfly with its wings apart soaking up the sunshine it's trying to warm up. The second reason sunshine is important is because butterfly plants like sunshine also. The general rule is the more sunshine, the better. That's why in many botanical gardens, you won't see any trees in a butterfly garden area. 
Now, having said that, you don't have to rush out and cut down every tree on your property. Many butterfly plants will live quite happily unless in full sun. Even if you only get four or five hours of sunshine a day, many plants are happy in this type of location. Even some shade-loving plants like impatiens can serve as a nectar source. Here's a list of a few plants which do quite well in just four hours of sunshine. Butterfly bush. Dame's rocket. Dianthus. Echinacea. New England Aster. Salvia. Shasta Daisy. And Slender Mountain Mint. Generally, if you buy more than one plant, consider planting it in different locations. That way you can find out which amount of sunshine it might need and which it prefers. Commandment number six, let the sunshine. Commandment number seven is butterflies prefer a messy garden. Most gardeners are a bit finicky. They like everything to look perfect, clean, and orderly, even during the winter. When all their plants have turned brown and ugly, they cut them down, put them in a shredder, or bundle them up with the local trash. What they don't realize is that many butterflies hang around during the winter in an egg, larva, or chrysalis form, and may be hiding out in that so-called trash. Gardeners may be throwing away next year's crop of butterflies by their neatness fetish. While a few butterflies, like the monarch, actually fly south for the winter, most do not. I encourage people to leave their garden alone during the winter and wait as late as possible in the spring to clean up. This picture shows the chrysalises of two black swallowtails. Notice how well they blend in with their stick or green stem. They use camouflage to hide their presence. There's a good chance you wouldn't notice these chrysalises if you were cleaning up the garden too early. You might also consider buying several butterfly houses to put out in your garden during the winter. But save your money. They are only home to spiders, roaches, and other pests. So commandment number seven, butterflies prefer a messy garden. And commandment number eight is design the garden before planting. Before you buy one plant, you need to spend some time designing the garden and answering some fundamental questions. First question is, where are you going to put the garden? I like to suggest that the answer should be as close to the house as possible so you'll be able to view it most of the day. If you have an area close to the kitchen or family room, that might be ideal. Sitting on your patio and watching the butterflies is a great summertime activity, but if it's 105 degrees, watching the garden in the comfort of an air-conditioned house is great. You may also need to consider how many hours of sunshine you'll get in this location. The more sun, the better but four or five hours a day will do fine for most plants. You might even consider taking out certain bushes or trees to get the needed sunshine. I also prefer to put a border around the garden to give it a finished look. It's not absolutely necessary, but it will help define the garden and keep out the grass. Curves are generally better than rectangles. A hose is a great way to help define the garden perimeter initially. In some cases, a fence is a nice way to define the garden and keep out kids and dogs. If you do install a perimeter border, you may have unknowingly created a miniature lake when it rains. If the water doesn't have anywhere to drain, it may be trapped inside. For this reason, I suggest mounting the dirt up to have proper drainage. If your property has a slight pitch already, this is not necessary. Another consideration is to add a path through the garden. Depending on the garden size, you may need to be able to walk through to do weeding and deadhead the flowers. Ideally, you should be able to reach all areas of your garden without having to actually step inside. You can use mulch, bark, stone, or any material to mark the path. The other advantage of a marked path is to keep people out of the plant area. 
Ultimate plant height and size is another consideration. You want to layer the plants so that the smaller ones are in the front getting their quota of sunshine. And don't put your plants too close together or the less vigorous ones will be crowded out. You need to do some research in this area and find out each plant's ultimate diameter and height. If the garden looks a bit sparse using this rule, fill it in with annuals. The conventional wisdom with perennials is that the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. A good example is butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. It grows very slowly the first few years, but with time will fill in a large area. Make sure your plants aren't too close to the border or the flowers will end up covering your grass. How big should your garden be? Smaller is generally better for the first time gardener. Design an area which you know you can take care of without too much work. If your garden is too large initially, it will be overwhelming and you may give up on it. Grasses, dormant seeds, and weeds are your biggest problem the first year. You can always enlarge your garden next year. For the apartment dweller and condo owner, consider using pots and barrels for your butterfly garden. Butterflies don't care or distinguish between flowers and containers or in the ground. Monarchs will even lay eggs on milkweed in a second story apartment balcony. For the small garden, consider using plants which are both host and nectar plants. Here are a few examples. Dame's Rocket, Kale, New England Aster, and all types of milkweed. Also remember the 10-40-50 rule. 10% 10 of your plants need to be blooming in early spring when there are fewest butterflies, 40% in the summer, and 50% in the late summer and early fall. Finally, put your design down on graph paper. It doesn't have to be done professionally, but you do want to have a basic idea where each plant will go. When you do buy your plants, set them out in the garden in their pot where your design dictates. Try to visualize what the garden will look like in a couple of years and make adjustments as necessary. Commandment number eight, design the garden before planting. Commandment number nine is to provide water and minerals to sip. Butterflies don't live by nectar alone and depending on the species, you may just as likely see a butterfly on the ground as on a flower. Why is that, you may ask? And the answer is that many butterflies can't get all the nutrients they need solely from flower nectar and they have to look for other sources. Butterflies are looking for sodium, amino acids, sugars, and other chemicals, not only for their own survival, but also for procreation. Males of many species gather together at a wet spot in what is called puddling to help gather these nutrients. So you may find butterflies on tree sap, dung, carrion, wet sand and soil, rotting fruit, and even human sweat. Some butterflies may also regurgitate a drop of fluid from their proboscis to help dissolve dry materials. Now when I say provide water, I'm not suggesting that you go out and buy a butterfly pond that marketing people will gladly sell you. You're just wasting your money. What you should do is water your plants on a regular basis and the butterflies will find the damp soil and other nutrients they need. Commandment number nine, provide water and minerals to sip. Commandment number 10 is to prepare the soil before you start planting. Many people are inclined to just dig some holes, plop in their plants, and then proudly proclaim, I must just have a black thumb. I don't know why my plants do so poorly. And the answer is, of course, they didn't do any soil preparation. Most butterfly gardens that I help install start with potter's clay, nice and thick, interlaced with rocks, glass, concrete, and tree roots. In fact, in many cases, the basement subsoil, which is dug out, is laid over any existing topsoil. Now, before you do anything to prepare the soil, it's most important to first make sure you call the utilities and find out where all your lines are located. You don't want to disrupt your phone service or cable TV. Most states have a 1-800 number to call, which will notify all the utilities to come out and mark their lines. After you decide your garden location, you need to use a herbicide to kill off all the grass and weeds. 
This will take a number of applications and a number of weeks. Start a couple of months ahead of time. I recommend using standard Roundup as it not only kills the vegetation, but breaks down quickly in the soil. Note that there is a new brand of Roundup, Extended Control, which contains a persistent killer which lasts for four months. You don't want this type. Now shovel off the grass layer and compost it if possible. You can rent a machine which does this for you. You then want to analyze your soil to see what your nutrient level is. Check with your local nursery to see who does soil analysis in your area. Usually the local university extension service provides this type of service, although it may take over a month. Your other option is to buy a pH meter, which is a test for soil acidity, and a soil test kit at your local garden store. You then need to add organic matter, fertilizer, and other amendments to your soil. Add lots of peat moss, hummus, compost, composted cow manure. You can't add too much to most soils. Don't add in any raw plant material like grass clippings or tree leaves. They'll take too long to break down and use up nitrogen that the plants need. At this time, you can add fertilizer and lime and sulfur if you need to change the soil pH. Fertilize with 12-12-12 at the rate of one pound per hundred square feet. When the soil dries out, rent the best tiller you can afford and invite a strong husky friend over and challenge them to ride the tiller for an hour or two. On brand new soil, it will be a rough ride. When you're done tilling, you can adjust the levels of the bed. By shoveling soil around and using your rake, you can raise or lower each section of your garden to help provide for drainage and walkways. Then place all your potted plants in your garden to get a sense of how everything will fit. Once everything is planted, you can mulch the garden. Mulch has a number of advantages for new gardens. It keeps out weed seeds, holds in water, and helps to control erosion. There are a number of choices available, but I'd say with organic products, which will break down and add to the fertility as you can see, garden preparation takes a little thought and a lot of work, but it's time well spent and you'll be rewarded with both beautiful flowers and butterflies. Commandment number 10 is to prepare the soil before you start planting. 